Moving to a new town in Texas, whether you're staying in the state, nearby, or coming from another state, can be exciting and overwhelming. So today, I'm here to help you navigate the essential services and resources that you'll need to settle in smoothly, whether you're just going across town or across the country. I'm Bruce, your local Texas real estate broker, and welcome to Lone Star Land. Let's start with the basics. When you move to a new town, you'll need to know who to contact for utilities, services, licensing, and more. Here's a breakdown of who does what and where to find them. For water, sewer, and trash, you'll want to contact your city's public works utilities department. In rural areas, the services may be managed by a municipal utility district or a private company. So let's take a look at a few of these options. So if you just go to a internet search and search in the city you're going to, we'll start with Plano here, city of Plano. You can take water or utilities, either one, and it will take you to their website. And you can click on there and it'll take you right in to the options you need. Most cities you can set up service, start and stop service on this one, different information, trash, recycling. Also with your trash out in the country, there are often a variety of private companies that will help you with that. And I pay more than I need to for that, but yeah. I don't recall what it was in the town, but out here it's about $40 a month and I don't use that much trash. So I'm probably going to be looking into some other options here soon regarding that. All right. So that's what we have for water. Just go to an internet search and pull up your county, your city, and whatever that service is, and then go from there. And it'll just give you more information. So that's what you've got there. And next, and for example, we'll take a look at another town, like a little long view. I typed in the same city of long view. Water utilities was my search criteria there. And that pulls up utility billing services, utilities accounts, can take you straight to their website, which is going to be this site here. So let's talk about electricity and gas. So when you're going to, um, if you're just wanting to find like a natural gas provider in your town, your best bet is to type in natural gas provider and then let's say we're in Allen so we'll put in 75002 that's one of the Allen Texas uh, zip codes and then it pulls up some different uh, options here utilities in Allen so they they're showing here they have natural gas from Encore and CoServe and who they have their electric from. So type in your city, natural gas, if it's available and your real estate professional should be able to help you determine what is available in the area you're moving. In many cases, if you're buying a property with a house on it already, you should be getting, in most cases, a uh, seller's disclosure. And on one of the last pages of the seller's disclosure, you have the um, utility information page. And if the seller provides that or knows it, then you may have that information available on that seller's disclosure. And you know, however, the seller's disclosure is not always required in some cases, such as an estate from an inheritance and trusts and things like that, where 
the person authorized to sell the property now may not have actually lived in the home and that type of thing. So there are some exceptions to needing a seller's disclosure. So next, let's go to, um, and similar, we'll go ahead and continue. Similar with the natural gas is the propane and propane you know that's where you're going to have a tank outside in the yard front back side wherever and with those you will want to um, either determine if that tank is rented or if it's owned and comes with the property if it's rented then you're going to need to get approved and rent again from the company that owns that tank and they're usually local companies and they will also handle monitoring and refilling for you in many cases you will pay an annual fee for the rental of the tank and then a lower fee for pounds gallons of refilling each year whereas if you own the tank then that company is not making money from the rental. So they're probably going to charge you more for the refilling per gallon. And keep in mind, they will also want to run a quality and a pressure check on that tank before they will even consider filling it. I have a really old tank. It's in great condition, but my propane service provider in this area won't even run a pressure test just because of the age of that tank so i bought a new 500 gallon tank to run my generator out back and i have a 250 gallon tank out front that's empty natural gas provider and your zip code I'll use 75002, which is in Allen, Texas, north of Dallas, and McKinney, and Plano, and Richardson, and all of those up in there in a fast-growing North Texas area. So then utilities here um, you can take that, and it'll show you who the options are, you know, who provides natural gas, you know, Atmos, CoServe. And then from here, we'll have the, you know, who is, who provides it to Allen. And then it'll load up, you know, those options. Then you just punch in their names. And you can probably even uh, find their websites from there. So that's who we have for the natural gas. And again, with your propane, you're going to want to ask around in town you know go to the farm store and talk to those people you know they'll have the best information or go to a cafe in town talk to some old people they will always have good references and information as far as who's going to have the best propane service and other services in a small town like that so then with your natural gas you can go you know like this is from atmos to sign up get some more information somebody will contact you and if it's an existing line on a house you know they may even be able to do it without coming out typically on natural gas and propane too if you have existing systems they're going to want to come out and Take a look, do a leak check, and make sure everything's functioning safely and properly before turning it on and changing it to your name. So as far as the electricity goes in Texas and a few other states, we do have an open 
system where in many areas you are allowed to choose your provider. Basically, all of the electrical systems will come from the same basic provider, obviously, but then there will be smaller companies or entities that can resell that. And through that, there is some competition. And in many cases, you can get some lower rates. So we'll take a look now at the website you will go to to find out if you have that option in the location you're moving. Let's look over here. So for that, we go to Power to Choose Texas, and you can leave spaces or no spaces if you want. So then go down here, and it gives you options on electricity rates. TXU is kind of the big provider there. And if you go to power to choose.org, then from here, just type in your zip code. And this is going to tell us if we have it. So if we go in my zip code here, we do not have it available. No plans found. It's not in an area open to competition. So I don't have a choice where I live. Let's say you're in. Collin County, or let's say Carrollton. Let's try Carrollton. 75006. And shows there's 50 different plans. You can check through all of that. So it tells you all of these different companies. Right. So we can change our zip code. Let's go to Plano. Let's go to. East Plano, 75074. So in East Plano, looks like there's 145 options here. So with this, you know, you have the option of going down. We're looking, basically, this column is going to be the company here. Then we have your plan details which kind of gives you a little brief overview on that. So some fixed rates for how long, updates, things like that, and how much renewable energy they use. This one is 100%. This is 26. This is 6. And then your price per kilowatt hour. These are all fairly the same so far. We're all generally going to be close to the same with a few little details of extra options that they can um, offer you to try to entice you to use their company. So, and then over here in this column, they have their phone numbers. So this one has a cancellation fee of $20 per month left in your plan. This one has hundred dollar cancellation fee this one has a hundred fifty dollar cancellation fee no cancellation fee here twenty dollars for every month 175 so even though their rates are pretty much the same they have a few different options in here to um, set them apart and differentiate some of what's happening so then when you click on one of these you can compare we'll just pick three that i have not heard of there's a lot of them now and then go back up here and hit compare and when you drop down these gives you a little more information you can look up documents and read more about each one if you'd like to. So, we will move my little marker, page marker, out of the way. Close that. So, then 
just pick out which one suits you best for your service area and that's pretty much how it is so this is the basic main company the primary electric provider for 75074 which is east plano again so that's how you're going to look into finding a specific electric provider rather than going just to the big TXU website and uh, dealing with them directly. Okay. Let's take a look here at some of the public services for uh, vehicle registration, driver's license. In many cases, you can go to your county tax assessor collector's office to register your vehicle. Every county is going to have one. For your driver's license, you'll need to go to a DPS or DOT, Department of Public Safety, Department of Transportation office and you should be able to check online for the nearest location and the required documents for that now if you're just moving within the state of texas and you don't have to get a new photo or anything on a renewal then in most cases you can renew and change your address for your driver's license online without having to go to a DPS office. So you go to dps.texas.gov and then click on driver's license and IDs that'll take you down here driver's license services you know in many cases like i said you can get uh, just online here so you want to click on this if you're just changing an address so if you click on that here then this allows you all of the options that you can do with the online system that you don't have to go into the office so in many cases you don't have to take that trip sit in line deal with all the lovely joyous happy people at the dps because we all know how much we love it and it's not always pleasant so those are a lot of things you can do online with your license you can renew it change your address you can renew it when you're out of state you can track the process of one that you've already requested all kinds of things so there's all kinds of options with those so that's great I would definitely do that before just heading to the office. And in many cases, the DPS office is going to be really, really full and take several hours of your day, especially in some of the bigger counties and busier counties like uh, Collin County, Dallas County. You know, when we went to get my daughter's driver's license, we actually set an appointment a couple counties over and we were able to get an appointment. I think we were able to walk in or we did it within a week, whereas Collin County, where we lived at the time, there was a two or three month waiting list. So, you know, if you're not into dealing with all of that nonsense, then you should probably try to see what you can handle online. They might charge a nominal extra little fee for credit cards, which is silly, but that's probably cheaper than the gas and the waste of time to 
drive and do all that. So again, through the dps.texas.gov for driver's license and things like that. And then for vehicle registrations, just type in Texas vehicle registration or uh, DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. And you can go there, you can change your address, renewing. Sometimes, you know, I would wait until I get, you know, if I move, I'm going to wait on this until I get my renewal form in the mail. And we'll get here in a minute. We'll cover how to change your mailing address with the post office. I wait till I get my renewal notice in the mail, and then I just take that to the new county and renew it there and change my address at the same time. So your DMV is txdmv.gov. Then go to online services. Gives you an option of all the things. Some of these you can do online as well. And with the renewals, even though the state has records of everybody's insurance coverage, for some reason they still want you to show a physical copy, which is absurd and kind of a pain. But they're going to want that. So you go under motorists, information, renew your driver's license. That's going to take you back to the other page, the DPS page, right, where we were a moment ago. And... Your other information, new license plates, titles, registration. This is what we're covering today. You know, if you're moving, I wouldn't bother too much with this until my expiration is coming up and then just do the renewal and license uh, or renewal and the address change at the same time. Other than that, I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about the registration of my vehicle. So then let's talk about now, let's talk about when you're moving, obviously you're going to want to change your address, your billing address, your mail, all of that. So when you change your mail, you can just go to the post office and get a form free, you know, in their little box there, they'll have an area in the 24 hour portion of the post office with all of their little forms and there's going to be a form there for you to pick up, fill it out, your current address, your name, and sometimes your phone number, and then maybe even an email address. And then it will have a space for your new address and when you are planning on moving or when you would like your mail delivery to stop at this location and start going to the next one or we can go to their website let's see where that is here so from here we can go to moversguide.ups or usps.com or the easy way is just from your search engine just straight out from your search engine type something like change my mail address or USPS for United States Postal Service, change my mailing address. And that will take you to their website and it pulls up the online form. And you have the option to get special offers which they're just going to mail you a bunch of stuff to your new address and probably email you also if you really want all that or update your register your update your voter registration so we don't need to do any either of those scroll down who is moving basically this is you know, if it's just you or your whole family or a business, pick one of these options, right? 
And then just fill out the forms. Names, Mr. or Mrs., whatever you want to be called, Captain, Professor, whatever that might be. Your email address, confirm it, put in your phone number. And then you hit, are you going to return within six months or less? I wouldn't bother changing my address that if I was doing that, if I still had access to the other place, but some people do that. So yes or no on here. If you're moving permanently, then click no. Then again, as you will have on the paper form option, when do you want to start forwarding mail? And then your old address, zip code, city, state, street. There you go. And then your new address right here. I would go through, double check your new address and all of those things. Make sure they are accurate. And then click next. And that's going to take you through the system. And so if you do it online, they're going to charge you a dollar ten. I've done it with the paper forms from the postal office and there's not a fee, at least there wasn't the last times that I have moved. So that's how that works with your changing address in your um, postal mail. So now we're going to get into something super fun, property taxes. Now, it's theft, it's disturbing, we need to eliminate them, but for now they're still here. So your um, appraisal district is the entity which determines the taxable value, sometimes based on market value and other conditions, and they determine the taxable value of your real property. And then the comp, not the comptroller, the um, county tax assessor collector is going to be the entity that collects your taxes and distributes them to all of the great super government agencies that get to decide how your money is spent. So let's talk a little bit about that and where to find those entities and a little more information for um, where we go about doing that. We'll head back over here. Hopkins County, Texas Appraisal District. There we go. Some of those are completely separate entities and they don't link to the county, I guess. Many of them do, in my experience. So then you go to the Appraisal District and be aware there are there are some websites that look like your county's appraisal district where you can run a property search and they'll give you just a little information and then they will try to charge you for all of the information those are not legit this is a government website all of the information is public record and it is free to peruse and look at online so you should be able to run full searches. Many of them are going to be, you know, whatever county dot CAD or the county CAD dot com dot gov dot org, things like that. So if it tries to charge you for something, go back and do another search for that county's appraisal district website. And you shouldn't have to pay a fee to view the public information. So watch out for things like that. So back here to the Hopkins County 
appraisal district you can search by name address legal description so if you are looking for you know the house you're moving to you can put in your address or property ID is the tax number um, some of these I'm kind of a map nerd so I like to search by the map but also you know, let's see you can do I think you can in Collin County so Collin Colin Cad. Go to my friend Gino's place. Is that Gino? Yep, that's Gino's place. So you can go to the home page. And yay, we have a new website paid for by the taxpayers. That should just be just lovely, and we're all happy. Have your general information here. You can do a property search. You can do, if you have any of this information, if you have any of this information, such as property ID, that's going to be your tax ID number on your um, tax billing statement. Owner name, you know, you can look up by owner name, owner ID, if you happen to know that. Or just go by the street number. Let's look up my old house where I grew up see what's going on there Got that in lived there from 1969 and my mom sold it in 2005 I believe so it was there for quite a while so this will give you the ID number the other geographic ID number, real property, the full address, square footage. The neighborhood here, residential, single family, legal description includes your subdivision, block and lot. And then we have an interactive property map, a subdivision map, and you can download a map as well most of the texas county appraisal districts will provide a similar website some of these websites are all operated by the same primary website designer or the website company who provides this type of site for a variety of taxing districts so in many cases you'll go to different county websites and they'll there's usually about I've seen about four different um, very similar or almost identical website styles and so they're all pretty easy to navigate there are a few that don't offer maps and there are a few that are kind of antiquated and hard to deal with but most of them in any areas of considerable growth or population are going to have a pretty decent easy to navigate website so we'll come back down here we can download forms and reports um, kind of tells you who the owners are if you click on this it tells you if they own any other properties nope that's the only one they have so if you know if you're looking for a friend or someone who you know he owns property more than one but you don't know the address you can type in their name and it will bring up all of the properties that that entity owns in that county many of those are can be different and hard to find if the people's names are you know if they have their personal name under some properties or a trust or a state name under some of the other properties they're not going to show up like that so you might have to do a little more research but basically what we're interested right now is how much our tax rate is on this property currently they're saying this one where i grew up is worth 457 440 and that's the appraised value no homestead cap loss on that the land is worth 126 and the house is worth 330 so total 457 4 
And then also what you're going to want to do within the first year or so that you live there after you close and move in, you're going to want to scroll down to wherever on whichever county you're on and find your homestead exemption application and click on that. You can, you, this one is their application. We don't need to download that. So we'll go down here to over here to forms. We can look up residential exemptions and then we can download the homestead apple ex exemption application, which is going to be the basic one. Sometimes you might need the new one. If you're a disabled vet, then you might want this one. Disabled people, tax ceiling transfer. There's a variety of um, forms. Basically, when you're moving, you're definitely going to want the residential homestead app. And then if you're going to be over 65, there are other forms as well. But here's the basic residential form. And then we just scroll through, we'll zoom in here a little bit, scroll through. Tax year is for this current tax year. And property taxes in Texas are paid in arrears, which means 2025 you pay for the 2024 taxed appraised year. Put in your property ID or the GEO ID if you know it. You can find that back on the other page where we had the information about that property right up here. All of that information is right here. So we're going to look for that and copy that information over to here. That would be a general homestead. If you're 65 or older, they do have additional taxing uh, reductions on that. Disabled veterans. Uh, so read through these. Check the boxes that apply to you. If you have questions, there are some descriptions on the back here on the next page for your qualifications on uh, the different statuses and what those apply to, right? So keep that in mind. There are directions on this other page for some of the other information that you might need if you're wondering which ones you may or may not qualify for. Just fill out all the information. Surviving spouse of a vet. Yeah, you get special qualifications. Check the boxes. Yes or no, depending on what you've got. Are you an adult, a couple? And this is really based on how you determine your name is going to be placed in the closing documents when you purchase the property. I would just keep it consistent with that and not bother. You know, if you're buying it as a couple, then you need to check this box and not just single adult. If you're buying it as a single individual, but you're married, but it's just going to be under one person's name and you're allowed to do that for your attorney recommendations, then feel free to do that. But then I would just check this based on your status regarding how you filed your information when you purchased the property. So keep all of that consistent. Otherwise you may confuse the county clerk and the people at the taxing entity. Okay. So basically just fill all of that out. Should be able to save it. Control S, save it and then print it or save it. And many counties will let you email it. You know, you can click here to print. You can print it as a PDF, take it down there. You can and give it to them in person. Or 
you can, uh, in many cases, email it to some of the counties. So sign and date, don't forget to sign that. And that's how the basic homestead application works right there. So that's how your property entity works. And then as far as, so that's as far as the appraisal district. Good. Then if we go to the, for the tax collector, that's just going to be under our, your county name, Texas, click that, go down, search and pay your property tax. See, this one has the appraisal district on Collin County, whereas the Hopkins County did not have that. So then county clerk, that's if you're going to file documents, your title company will work with them to file um, for your property that you made. And then your Collin County offices will click here that we should be able to find departments, government, tax assessor. There you go. So the other was the appraisal district who determines the property tax taxable value on your property. And then the tax assessor is going to be the entity responsible for collecting the property taxes. And they also, in many cases, will collect your vehicle tax and registration, all of that. And then they work through, I believe, the comptroller office of the state. And that money's distributed to all of the little government places that it needs to go. So Collin County's growing. They used to just have the one office in McKinney. Now they have a bigger office in McKinney and they also have an office in Plano and Frisco. So the three largest cities in Collin County. So that's their websites and you can go through there, gives you a map, tells you where to go. Really, you will find this office in many cases at the same location as the county clerk, county court, and uh, it'll usually like this here will be a larger building with many of the county services departments in there in the same building. So that's where you find them. All right. And that's the taxing entities. All right, let's talk a little about some other services. Uh, we'll start with if you are uh, moving to a place and you need to have some electric or gas line work or something like that, or otherwise, if you're going to be remodeling, updating, doing any earth moving and construction, then you want to check and make sure before you dig that you're not going to hit any gas lines, electric lines, uh, old phone cable, water lines, things like that. Because when I moved to my place, I failed to call them. It was winter. It was gnarly. And I was just clean up crazy mode with the tractor. And I actually... Busted a water line in the winter. That was fun. Then I fixed that. And then I ran into another one. <laughs> and I fixed that. So after I fixed the second water line, I pretty much knew where the water lines were. But since then, when I've done electrical projects and things like that, digging, then I've I've made note to contact the property proper entities on getting that done. So here we're going to take a look at Texas 811. You can just type in 
texas811.org. And if you're going to be digging, we'll just go here and get started. We're going to, they have a very simple form. Kind of go through here. Basically, if you're a contractor, you would notify them on that side. If not, then just go to the homeowner page. So we're going to get started. You're going to tell them when and where you're digging. So they're asking for answer a few questions. Get started. I'm going to give in your name. We'll just put in my name, email address, and then your phone number, then your address. Here, and then asking about the location of your project. Will the project take place here? Yes. Closest street, not the closest major street. Put in my street. Here, is it inside the city limits? No. How far from the street? Intersecting street is my street. Did that say intersect? Closest intersecting street. Okay. So that one, I'm not real sure. Let's take a look at a map. I think it's 1260 or 1244. Let's zoom in here. 1266. I guess 1244 is the other direction. Okay. I don't pay attention to those things. Okay. We will go back to the 811 day. Back in here. Twelve sixty six is the closest. No, not in the city limits. Three quarter mile. I'm pretty sure. Let's measure. We'll do a Google Map measure from here. So I'm going to right click, measure distance to where I think my water meter is. Look at it this way because I want them to mark where my water meter is. There's my pond. I think my water meter is right about here. So 4376 feet, we'll go there. The intersecting street is my street. What? That's weird. My street is zero feet from the intersecting street because it intersects. That question is nonsensical, I do believe, 4376, we'll say that. At least five and no more than 50 characters. Okay. Um, 
200 feet. Oh, come on. That's stupid. It's on the east side of the road. County's camp. Found it on a map. Yes, that's correct. Refer the markers dropped at the current location. Choose next. That is correct. You find your property. They'll need to know where you're planning to dig. Next. Hmm. Say one month. Will we be using explosives? No, I will not. Where in the property will I dig? South. Deeper than sixteen inches, maybe. Have you indicated the area? Yes, I will mark them. And that will submit it. And that needs, I need them go market. So then within two hours, they'll send me an email confirming. Within 48 hours, they should be marked. And then here is our list of colors. I'm going to use the white paint and then obviously survey markers are pink, electrics red, gas is yellow, fiber is orange, water is blue, irrigation is purple, sewer is green. So that's basically who we want to contact before we dig so we don't cut into something we don't want to cut into. All right, next let's go to... basic emergency services and let's take a look here so if we go to just your basic internet search and you type in emergency 
What county are we doing this time? Let's do Holt County with Greenville. Holt County, Texas. Holt County, Texas. And we have government. We'll have our constables, commissioner court, sheriff. Sheriff's going to be a good resource for all kinds of things. If you have problems with anything county related, that's the city doesn't handle. And I prefer to deal with the sheriff instead of the city police. Anyway, the sheriff is elected and they tend to be more realistic and competent in my experience than city police who are controlled typically by the mayor and they're a little more susceptible to corruption from what I've seen. So I prefer sheriffs instead of city police. And so then you'll have, uh, the city will have your fire station. If you're going to want the police station phone number for any reason, you know, obviously you have 911 for emergency throughout Texas and mo many other states, I guess most other states. But if you want the, let's say you want to call the police station to find out something in general, just type in that city. Let's see. The Pleasant Police Department gives you the address in South Carolina, Washington, Texas. Here we go. So then it just gives you their non emergency numbers and all that contact info there. If you want to talk to who that is and what all they can do for you. Same with the fire department, probably. Yep. So you don't want to call 911 to talk to them. If you have a question for them or job interests and inquiries or a tour of the facility, anything like that, or events they may be hosting. Yeah, you want to call the non-emergency number, obviously. That's pretty easy and straightforward. Then, within your county, uh, you know, your, let's go back here, back to the county. Let's go back to Collin County. Particularly if you are living in a rural area outside of the city limits, then you may have more questions for your county commissioner. Your county commissioner is going to, let's see right here, we have the commissioner's court. Your county commissioner is going to be a great resource for many things, particularly if you live out in the country in a rural area. So if you're out of city limits and you need you know, potholes or road work or some infrastructure issues like that, then you'll find out which area you're in. Like here on this page, Collin County, you have Daryl Hale. I've met him. He's a good guy. He controls. It's a very large area, but it's not as populated. It's definitely growing. It's in the high growth corridor of Collin County. This is 121 right up here. With all of that. So it's growing a lot. Salina, Melissa, all of this, and Trenton, all of those things. So you want to contact the commissioner of the precinct, commissioner's court precinct that you are in, 
and they're a good resource for again road work if you have uh, other issues in many cases i've had clients who have purchased land that did not have a driveway and in many of the counties north texas and east texas um, through the commissioner's court they've been uh, able to provide a very low cost and cost effective proper driveway into their land. So how that worked for all of my clients who have done this is we've had them contact the county commissioner and through that department, someone comes out and evaluates the land with or without the home landowner there, but it's best if the landowner or sometimes I will be there on their behalf if they're out of state or out of town. And with that, the engineer or the crew chief for that county on the utilities project commission will take a look at it. They'll determine what size pipe, how much rock, all of that that they'll need. And then generally how this has worked for my clients when we've done this is the commissioner um, will have his crew arrange for the culvert pipe usually at least 18 or 24 inch diameter and 20 to 30 feet long they'll arrange for that and the rock and the landowner will pay for the culvert pipe, usually just a few hundred dollars, and the rock, usually just a few hundred dollars. And then from there, when that's all arranged, the county will send trucks to go pick up the rock and the culvert pipe. Some, some counties will have their own uh, rock stash or supply, but they will go pick up, they'll take flatbed trailer, go pick up the culvert pipe. They'll take uh, loader trucks and go pick up the rock. They'll have another trailer truck with a backhoe and maybe a skid steer, usually just at least a backhoe. And then they will take that material out to the site. The crew will properly install that. In some cases, the county engineer or someone similar will take a look and approve the work and sign off on it or just give a thumbs up and then you know they've compacted it properly you've got a nice driveway into your land with proper drainage at the road and it's just it's usually well under a thousand dollars for the several clients that i've helped um, arrange that through their county commissioner so that's something great that um, the commissioner's court can be of assistance with, with your uh, land and other rural projects. You know, if the road washes out in a massive rainstorm or something like that, then instead of just calling the city or the county clerk or something, you really want to talk to the county commissioner. They are elected officials. And they are elected by the people in that specific precinct. So they're, they're going to answer to you and your neighbors. So the county commissioners that I've met have all been great folks. And um, they like to help the people in their community with the infrastructure and other projects. And also with the commissioner's court, they help decide and vote amongst themselves on behalf of the their precincts and the people in the county they vote on you know other infrastructure projects that are outside the city limits that are not necessarily on a texas dot department of transportation road like the state highways and interstates things like that but the county roads they would they would help with all of that so commissioner's court is definitely a great resource so keep that in mind 
And again, you'll find that through the county website, uh, whichever county you're looking for. So now we're going to discuss some of the more rural services that are available throughout Texas. In rural counties, you can contact your local Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Office for agricultural services and Texas A&M Forest Service for forestry services. So, let's see here. We can go up. So, for your AgriLife Extension, you can go to agrilifeextension.tamu.edu. TAMU stands for Texas A&M you know, Agricultural and Mechanical University.edu. So, from there, where you can just run a basic search for Texas AgriLife Extension, and that'll take you right to it. So from here, we're going to go to County Offices over here. Click on that. Alphabetically, you can find your county. Let's go to Harrison County. We'll try that down south of us right here with Hallsville and Marshall and all that. So from here, and all of these pages are going to be identical, but based on your county uh, residence or where your land is, this is a great resource for uh, land planning and activities. Uh, so you can go to the county office website. Over here, we have your address their Facebook page if you want to check them out on Facebook and message them that way email phone numbers all of that right there we go to their website for their specific county you can go to their master gardeners program even if you're not going to be gardening it's a really great program for the Texas master gardener system to learn about um, different plants and plant species and even some insects. Master Naturalist Program is another great um, resource they have. Those are not free, but they're definitely worth it, whether it's just continuing education or something you're really interested in. Let's go to their website. Take a look here. So from here has a list of their calendar events and things that they're doing. You know, they have a recipe of the month on their little page. Lots of fun with that. Yeah, wildlife seminars. Those are always very informative. You know, you actually go out and learn about wildlife conservation and wildlife management here you know this is in for harrison and panola county so that's going to be in carthage which is panola county just south of harrison southeast of longview and so that's a great program if you can go to that it um, says it's a free event and that's coming up october 3rd that's about a week from now next uh, week and a half so the weekend after this that's awesome. So your AgriLife department will have all kinds of great um, events like that. And also, so through the AgriLife department and the A&M Forestry Service, sometimes you can find those folks in some of the counties. They'll be at the same office as the tax office and the county clerk and all that. Many of the counties like my county and Upshur County just south of me 
and some others that have a very big urban or rural, sorry, rural presence with a lot of farming and agriculture and wildlife and forests and woods and hunting, they will often have their own individual freestanding office just for the agri-life and the forestry department. And one thing that's great about that is, you know, when you're buying land, you can contact them in person or on the phone. I like to go in person and just meet them. But you can schedule an appointment for one of their wildlife and forestry specialists to come out and walk your land with you. They'll point out several types of plants, uh, beneficial invasive species. You know, they'll point out many of the wildlife tracks, whether it's, you know, footprints or scat or different activity evidence throughout your land and give you advice on you know, what your goals are, whether you want to improve your land for hunting or just wildlife management in general, which is what I do. If you want to you know, grow crops or plant timber like pine, things like that. So they can help by just walking your land with you. And on very large tracts, it would be great if you could have a side by side or something for them so you guys can go a little more efficient on the land but um, be prepared to do some hiking as well and they will be a great resource and tell you the types of grasses the types of foliage and shrubs and all, all sorts of things they're just super super helpful and i've never had them ask for money it's part of what they do and they've never even accepted when I tried to give them a tip so deal with that and keep that in mind they're also you know and they're going to be in pretty much every county as far as I know let's see let's go to the AM forest service And through the Forest Service, you'll have a, um, they often have, yep, here it is. They'll have a link down here. So you can check on this to determine if, which counties have burn bans in effect. You know, usually that's more in the summer. We've had more rain lately. We didn't have a super hard summer this year, so that was nice. Let's see if this will load up for me or if we're going to have... Loading issues with our internets. What is our internets doing? So that one's going a little slow, but let's see here, we'll hit stop on that and we'll try it again. There we go. Now it's a working. And they have a burn man map. Oh, I don't know that we have any. There may be some in West Texas that are still under burn bands. Yep. So, zoom in, click on the county. Yep. So, Collin County has a burn ban. Fannin, Grayson, click up here. These counties that are in white do not have a burn ban. So, it'll just tell you the county. So, you can just look and see. You know, really more of the counties to the west, a few north of Dallas, but mostly East Texas has got plenty of rain down by the Gulf Coast. So most of the western counties are, you know, even though there's not much grass to burn, 
they're still in a, a burned van because of the lack of water. So, so that's where you go for that. And through the forestry page, they have all kinds of great information here. You know, landowner assistance. They'll hike your land with you, and they'll be able to give you a lot of information just through the website. Loads of documentation here that you can research and um, print off, all kinds of stuff. So it's a great resource through the Forest Service, and you want to keep that link handy. We'll put links to these things down in the description of the comments and my little picture mover if I move it too fast it doesn't like it and it locks up my page so we'll turn that off here for a second and so that's the a and Forest Service and the A&M AgriLife Extension and you can just type in AgriLife like agricultural life, agri life extension, and it'll give you the links for that, or agri life forestry. And that'll take you to the forestry page. So that's all of that. And through each individual, you know, county page. They'll have different programs that they're doing, maybe links to their Facebook or social media pages, 4-H, if you're interested in getting your kids involved in learning about um, livestock and farming, things like that, that would be great. We need more farmers and fewer politicians, so please raise farmers and do not raise politicians. We have too many of the politicians, and we need to I'm not going to say put them in the soil, but that might grow too many more, or it might not. Never know. So here on the Collin County page, we've got um, master naturalist programs, landowner series, soil testing, pond management, pasture management, pest management, all kinds of great information through the AgriLife Extension, which is um, a free service through all of the counties in Texas. And I'm not a huge fan of every Aggie I have met, but I do appreciate their passion for helping the community, especially the rural community, with all of their um, options there. Then again, here's the main homepage. They've got all kinds of great resources on here. So if you live in rural parts of Texas, you may not have a 911 address or a physical address. It may just be lot, whatever, or nothing. County Road 1234. So you can run a search for... Um, 911 address and here we go so type in how do I register my address or how do I get an address new home your authority Collin County Ellis County these are in North Texas Northeast Texas, we'll go to Collin County here. Click on that. From here, their page is not found. That's awesome. We'll go back. We'll try another one. Government websites are always a joy to play with. Hunt County. They have a lot of rural stuff going on. That should work. 911. Let's see what their application is. Okay, here's an application for Hunt County. Just fill it out, your date. You don't issue the date, they do. Your owner name, your current address, phone number, email, 
from the ID, the road num name and number of acres. Some of these you're going to, some of the counties, I'll show you one in a minute, in East Texas, you can actually put in on a map coordinates. So this one, Hunt County, they have a paper form. You can attach a map and all that. You have to um, physically mark your stakes or flags where you're going to have your entrance to that property. And then, so in the state of Texas, probably other states as well. I know in many other states. I don't know about all, but I suspect all. They have an addressing grid so that depending on which side of the road it's going to be on, it'll be positive or negative. And then based on uh, increments from the beginning to the end of the road or distance from town and mapped out from decades gone past long ago. So let's go to the East Texas Council of Governments. I like their page better. It's easier to deal with them. Services. Nine one one addressing. As East Texas, they do a lot more of this because there are more rural areas out here. So nine one one address verification. And you're going to go on, verify online. You're going to put in your date, your form, phone number, property owner, submit that. And then from there, it's going to take you through the steps. You can upload a map. I have done this for some of my clients who are out of town and out of state when they bought land in Texas. Or if they're splitting land that they own that we're going to sell to get them an actual address. And then from there, after you get your address, usually it just takes a week or so, and they will email you and or mail you a hard copy of your new address. Then from there, maybe we'll go into more detail on this in another episode sometime with rural stuff. But from there, you can actually get that mapped into Google and confirmed as an address. So I don't know why we have all these little dots. What are these dots? Oh, that's where I had trees falling down. I marked them on my Google map. Okay. So there is a way we'll go into in another episode on how to after you get your new 91 street address from the Council of Governments, wherever you're going, that you can then go onto Google. We'll show you that later sometime on how to get that marked properly on Google. So that's it with the Council of Governments and getting your 911 address. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at different Wi-Fi internet options and where we find those services. And we'll probably go into a few details on the different options as well. So whether you're streaming your TV or just need phone service, in your house or computer Wi-Fi, lots of different options. And we'll start by covering the general uh, types of internet. So here we're on internetadvisor.com. And quick little guide here as far as um, Speeds needed for different apps. Not sure what Slack is, but Zoom meetings, six and three up and down, Skype, eight and one and a half up and down and up, 
sorry, down and up. Hangouts, I don't use that. So let's see. The service types. The <clears throat> fastest is going to be fiber. You're going to have up to a thousand megs plus for some of the fiber optic. That's considered the best that we have available right now in most areas. Um, generally, you're going to only have that in you know, cities or office industrial parks. Probably not if you're out in the country. So, cable is the next best. And get up to 50 to 100 megs download download is generally when you're searching and what you're doing uploading is more sending files out so most people will not be uploading as much as they will be downloading <clears throat> with cable there is a little lag. We'll get into this in a minute. There is often a little lag regarding um, how many people are on in your neighborhood or in your area. You have different options with satellite internet. DSL uses the phone lines. Many new homes, they're not even putting new phone lines in, but they're putting in some um, Cat5, things like that, which are going to be a little faster than the DSL and faster than most of your satellite as well. Often it's as fast or faster than cable, depending on the system and the provider. Dial up. I don't know that anybody still has this since the 90s, but if you still have dial up, you are out of luck and you might as well. Just go to the library and get free Wi-Fi on your phone or your laptop because that is horrible. And as they say here, any other option is better than dial-up. But for Gen X people, that's what we grew up with and that's what we learned on. So, okay. Quick topics. Fiber optic. Um, generally... Don't run into availability issues. It's usually very fast unless you have an outage. You can do pretty much anything you need to do working from home or online. High, down, high download speeds. With that, the cable. <clears throat> Lots of the urban areas will have cable, especially from the early 2000s late 90s through um, through the past five or ten years they still have cable in a lot of areas so with cable you do have the problem where like they mentioned here you can get interference from too many people using it at the same time. Too many people using it at the same time. Too many people using it at the same time. Too many people using it at the same time. And they might get the speed they advertise, but when there's a lot of people on the system at once, generally, First thing in the morning and then, you know, 5 to 8 p.m. When people are getting home from work, those are going to be uh, slower times and you might see some lagging with cable. Satellite internet. Satellite internet was novelty for a while. Technology's gone better now. There's still some limitations such as... The average um, speed is usually pretty low for many of them. We'll check out a couple here in a second. Um, the price is pretty high considering what you get. And hefty installation fees. So we've got that. Let's go check out some of the satellite 
providers here. Um, this is CNET.com. And obviously the best pick is Starlink, which is the Elon Musk Tesla based product. Then Usenet, which I've heard is horrible. And Viasat, which some people say is okay, but it's super expensive. So we'll go down here and take a look at some more details. Starlink, they consider Starlink the best, which Starlink is what I have. And it was about $600 for the actual product, the disc, the dish, and all the equipment to set up. But it set up really fast. I was able to connect everything. I just temporarily set it up in my driveway and it hooked up and I had internet. It is around $120 a month, but I use the Starlink for streaming TV and all of my internet connections, home Wi Fi. Everything is through the Starlink dish. So I don't have a separate cable bill or anything like that for my TVs. And so we'll take a quick look in their full review. Speed, they give it a 6.5. Considering I get usually around 50 to 100 megs per second, that's pretty good. Considering the plan I had before, which was working off the Wi-Fi on the cell towers down the road, I was paying a little more than 120 a month. And I was only getting about 15 to 20 megs per second at um, download. And that was horrible. It was hard to do anything useful. So CNET gives Starlink a... 6.5 out of 10 values, 6 of 10 customer care, 7 of 10 pros, decent speed for rural. Now, if you can get anything like wired, then you should. This is really mostly for if you don't have any good options for wired or cable internet or fiber or anything like that. Cons, high upfront cost. Again, that was about $600, a little slower than cable or fiber. And it's vulnerable to inclement weather. So yes, with that, you need to mount your dish so it doesn't fall over in heavy winds. Use net. It's okay. I've heard some people are okay with it. Some people say it's horrible and atrocious. Um, let's read their full Point score on this one. So they give Usenet uh, 6 of 10. That's unusual considering how I've heard so many people don't like it. 5.5 uh, for value. You know, if you're paying for something that doesn't work well and you can't use it, then it's not a great value. Using that inter internet reviews here, and we'll go back and take a look at the Viacom or Viastat. Viasat. I'm not real familiar with them in this area. Open some of their breakdowns. They get a 6 out of 10, 5.5 out of 10 value, and 6.5 of 10 on customer care. Pros and cons, probably going to be expensive. Yep, so you've got high prices that increase after three months. Speeds are only up to 12 megs, which is horrible. Uh, might as well go to the library and use theirs for free. Pros, it's available in many rural areas. Speeds are faster than some of the rural providers no data overage and they're improving their download speeds so that's kind of what you get with the satellite internet and 
wouldn't be too stoked on that unless that's your only option. And again, it was well worth it for me to pay the additional upfront costs for the uh, Starlink program. And I'm very pleased with that. DSL. Let's see. They use the phone lines. Um, some of that's moving more towards Cat5 now. Downloads are 3 to 50 megs. That's um, pretty slow. I get much better than that with my... Oops. Starlink satellite dial-up is obviously really, really slow. And you should avoid that at all costs. So that's kind of the options of what you have available. And when you're going to decide what's available in your area, if you don't know your zip code, your best bet is, you know, you can go to unitedstateszipcodes.org, or it should be on some of your documents. It should be on the property listing and other things for where you're looking to buy. You can type in. On an internet search, just type in internet and your town or internet and your zip code. Do one here for Longview. And so then you get some ads for different plans and options. So we'll just type in the zip code of the home you're interested in or the home you're buying. And Google will find something for you. So that's pretty easy there. And then you just have lots to choose from. You know, you might check with um, Yelp or do a little search on internet and your zip code. And then type in reviews. And you can maybe get some options on who the fastest are in that area and that zip code. Then you'll need to check with that specific carrier that you're interested in and make sure they do have an offer for that location. And that's pretty much all there is to that. The Wi Fi and internet services are. You can get something everywhere. If you can't get fiber optic or cable, then your next best bet is to go, in my opinion, with the Starlink system. And I'm following Elon Musk on Twitter, but I don't think he's following me. But, you know, shout out to him for developing all of that with his Skynet monster service. So, that's what we have for the internet services and Wi-Fi. So hope everybody got something useful out of this. And we will chat with you later about the next topic. Have a great day. So thanks for joining us. I hope this guide helped you get settled into your new Texas home. If you have any questions, need further assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out. Welcome to Texas or welcome back to Texas. And remember, I'm here to help make your move as smooth as possible. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Lone Star Land for more tips and local insights. Here's a quick reminder to hit that like button, subscribe and share with folks who will appreciate learning about Texas real estate and life in the Lone Star State. Check that link in the description to schedule a video chat with me, and we hope to hear from you soon. Now back to our video.